This content has been brought to you by my day ones. If you want to support this channel, you can head over to Patreon at Villainous underscore music. What's poppin'? Welcome to Overthrow Media, your best place for hip hop, politics, and life. It is Big Villainous, your big homie, that revolutionary organizer, MC, artist, and international sex symbol. Let's get it. Today, we're going to be talking about black versus white masculinity in response to that dang dad. Let's get it. Blaming our skin for your insignificance. Aiming your stick at us, no hesitance. Truth is, fam, you brought the pestilence. Look inside your house and go and handle that shit, bitch. All right, yo, welcome everybody. But before we get into this video, we got to hear a word from our sponsor. Y'all know for sure that y'all the only sponsors that I got. So make sure to cop a dope ass t-shirt off Teespring and to support me at Villains underscore music on Patreon. Let's get it. We're about to hop in this video and give a quick response to that dang dang. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to That Dang Dad. My name is Phil. Over there. Everywhere. The other night, I decided to treat myself to a cigar. I took it out on the porch and I enjoyed it during a beautiful summer thunderstorm. And it got me thinking back to when I was smoking a lot of cigars with my guy friends in my teens and 20s. Cigar smoking is one of my clearest memories as a cisgendered man being taught how to do manliness by other cis men. See, there's a lot of ceremony that goes into cigar smoking. Uh, first, you need to cut the cigar. Uh, you could use your teeth, but that's a little gauche. You should be using a cutter. Uh, then you have to toast the cigar a little bit to get it ready. Then you light the cigar, preferably with a match instead of a lighter. Some of the cigar dads said that the proper cigar smoking pace was no more than one or two strong puffs every minute. When you were done, you gently laid the cigar in the ashtray. You never stubbed it out. A cigar is a work of art. It must be respected. So I gotta first say, fuck Arnold Schwarzenegger. He killed Tookie. Let's see that dude drown. I don't care. Fuck that nigga. Now, off of that, I just gotta say, I don't know nothing about cigars. Uh, niggas did not smoke cigars unless you were like Nate Dogg or something, bro. Like, nigga, you know what was an art, though? Rolling up them blunts, man. Or what about them Garcia Vegas? We rolled, put a weed up in there, roll it up. And see, we weren't like a couple puffs per minute, man. We we're like puff, puff, pass, nigga. Everybody gotta hit the blunt. We know nothing about no cigars. I try to roll one of those cigars into a blunt right now. Man, I found out that it was just like a bunch of leaves together, so it didn't roll very good. So we couldn't roll a fat blunt like I intended to, and it was just all bad. You know what I mean? The only way we get the big ones is if we get the swishers. Those big ones worked, but they only worked to a certain degree because you can roll up like a quarter, but that's at best. And that was an epic blunt. So that was what we seek for. Um, but it wasn't about being a man. It's just like, man, we need to smoke a fucking blunt, man. Stress got to stress. <laughs> All right, let's go. As a teen, I took cigar ceremony very seriously because the people that had taught me how to smoke a cigar were my friend's older brothers that used to invite us to their poker nights. And I just very badly wanted to be worthy of that invite. I wanted to be sophisticated and worldly. I wanted to be a man. Oh, yeah. So wait, wait, wait. I just got to say this. So what it sounds like, is that you were following a bunch of people who were trying to follow a bunch of other people who were all trying to be grown, but they were all, but they all were kids, right? Bet, bet, bet. I remember days like that. Not behind that, but I remember days like that. I was raised with many other lessons in manliness too. For example, I grew up religious, so I learned that the man is the head of the household, the spiritual leader. He's responsible for making the big decisions in his family. He's responsible the spiritual development of his family. Oh, yeah. From my dad, I learned that a real man always showed up early, always left late, always offered to help out. And from him, I learned that when you drop a girl off at her house, you always wait and make sure that she gets inside before you drive away. From my time in martial arts and law enforcement. Oh, shit. That nigga is the ops. I had not been knowing that. Like, I mean, he's a formed op, so he's supposed to be on our side now. 
And so I'm giving him this chance, man. I'm gonna check him out and fuck with him. He's in like this one group I'm in. So hopefully we all connect and be able to have a conversation. I actually wanna have a conversation with him. From like an ex-con to an ex-cop, let's get it. Like I'd be, actually that'd be fire. That would be fire, bro. And I, I'll be a hundred about that. So like, you know, I'll, I'll be hundred. We'll never be best friends. I'm gonna have a little bias against you, but I'm also someone who will hear shit out, especially once you're a fellow anarchist. Uh, but, you know, I'm not gonna lie. The cop thing's always gonna sketch me out with this dude. Which is what it is. I don't fuck with cops, you know? I learned that men were protectors. That being a man meant being ready and willing to do violence to protect what was yours. Law enforcement and religion taught me that the guilty needed to be punished. That a real man wasn't afraid to put the fear of God into people doing evil. Real men should intimidate bad guys, hurt them, maybe even kill them. If the law was too lenient, sometimes a man had to take matters into his own hands to do what was right. I learned that men had to suffer quietly. They had to show calm. Check this, bad, bad, bad. Okay, so I think this is where one of the ways that black and white masculinity deviate. Or I'm not even gonna say deviate, but it isn't based on masculinity for at least niggas. You know what I mean? I, mean, I guess there's black folks that are bougie that probably do very similar things to like white culture, where it's like machismo and trying to build up this masculinity by trying to enforce violence or use violence and as a way to show how manly you are. But that's always been corny the way I grew up, right? Everybody always thought I was a chump shit. And the reason is because we are, are like that already, but it's not because of trying to be manly. It's because we grow up in very desperate situations. And because of that, we are liable to know that sometimes, especially that we don't use the police, sometimes you gotta put the fear of God into somebody real quick like to protect your people. If someone attacks someone you love, you gotta show them what time it is. Now, that is not to say that's what makes you a man. That's called living within your situations. You know what I mean? And I, I think that's one of the things that differs because I don't think a lot of niggas do that to be hard. Niggas do that because they don't see other options. You know what I mean? People don't run the conflict. And actually, one of the things that happened with this uh, domestic abuser that tried to kill me, like he, and I try to explain to him many times before I escalated to this point, but he's one of them people that thinks that acts of violence and aggression is what it takes to be a real nigga. And he's like a bougie black dude. So he came from an upper middle class family and he's really like chasing that machismo, right? But he has a fictional concept of how that really works because it's coming from a very like white ass culture. And it's not because he's white, but because, you know, upper middle class, he's a socialized around white people. People have told him many times he talk and act and fat, fuck around in very white ways. And it's really true. Um, but one of the things is how he perceives hood niggas, right? He pre perceives us as like someone who's trying to prove themselves through conflict. And yeah, there's some 14 year olds trying to do that, but they're 14, they're little boys. Of course they are. That's little kid shit. But in reality, people are dealing with that in ways that they have to, right? So, you know, you don't use the police. So if someone attacks your family, you gotta make an example out of them to make sure that everybody understands if you come from my family, you come from a mother love, there's gonna be a problem. It isn't about being tough though, it's about survival. And I think that that is the difference, right? And people who do it to seem like a man, we call it goofy. You know what I mean? They're goofies, bro. Like they're not, they're not really about that. They're not, they don't live that life. They're not, you know, that's not what they're on. They're just trying to be like tough and a man and shit. And that doesn't make you a man. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know what the being a man really means, but it sure as hell ain't that. You know what I mean? It sure is like that. Little boys try to perpetrate, try to pose and be posers. You know what I mean? Grown ups, grown men, grown women don't do that. We just don't. We accept who we are and how we can leverage who we are towards our and our community's advantage. Just facts. All right, let's get this. In the face of danger, they had to be the rock when everyone else was freaking out. I learned that some men couldn't hack it in dangerous professions, that they were weak for not being able to do violence, for needing therapy. One of the most influential trainers I ever had in law enforcement told me that any man unwilling to carry a gun everywhere that he went in civilian life was a sheep 
From both my dad and law enforcement, I learned that men show affection through teasing, through annoying each other, mean jokes, antagonizing each other. I learned that if a man didn't make fun of you, it meant that he didn't really like you. And thus, to show other men that I liked them, I learned to rib them. However, from my dad and my favorite sergeant, I learned that real men were leaders who should always support their subordinates and make I want to stop real quick. Um, so the rib and the roasting, I also think that's where it deviates too, because it is similar. But one thing I noticed is like in white, white male culture, right? Because I moved around a lot. I'm from the hood, but also when I was little, I was in the hood and I was in the suburbs, I was in the hood and I was in the suburbs. And that's kind of how my life was, right? So one thing I realized when I was in the suburbs is when white folks do it, it's very malicious. It's very fucked up. You know what I mean? Um, and it's like a type of bullying. And that's kind of what he's describing, right? This is ribbing them. They know it's that like, uh, what they call it, gym culture or whatever. Uh, but I see when this is in the streets, I do feel like it's different because it's not for one, not just men. It's men and women alike. Um, but they have the dozens and they just roast each other. But it's really to build thick skin, to work on y'all's jokes, to let out some steam. It's not the same thing. It's not because, oh, I'm being a man. It's not about being a man to roast somebody. It's honestly, motherfuckers associated more with it being from the streets because the dozens is something that we do. You know what I mean? Just clowning each other. I was never really good at it, but I have appreciation for it. But I find a very difference between that and when white folks do it because the way and the reason they do it is completely. I don't know, it's just malicious. It's not even like, I don't know. It feels like when people roast you in the hood or black community, it's to point out contradictions with you uh, so you can work on them. And they're gonna poke fun at you until you work on it. It's just, it's just what it is. But when it's white folks, it's like kind of like, a, it's like the frat boy thing where they're like, a, what's the word? Um, hazing, where they like haze you. And that's a total different type of dynamic in my opinion. Um, yeah, and it's not that niggas don't have problems. We do, and I'll touch on that later, but we have different problems. And I think one of the things we seem to be peak masculinity to people, when we talk about going back to the violence thing, I think that's also has to do with the origins of a lot of people being soldiers and warriors and traumatized people interacting in a certain way. And so people have took in trauma responses as the way it is to be a man. But I'll get into that a little bit later. Let's go them look good. I learned that a real leader takes all the blame and none of the credit for his team's performance. Leadership is a servant position. From conservative I talk radio, I learned that being a man meant being rational, detached, logical, calculating. I learned that being a man meant being able to make the tough choices, the hard decisions. Being a man meant hardening your heart against sob stories and emotional manipulation. A real man did what was best for his family and for his country, even if that meant others had to suffer. Real men did what was necessary. And look, I know my experience is not universal. So look, it's like this, man. Um, Like I was saying earlier, I feel like there's a lot of like men being forced to be warriors and soldiers and so on and so forth. And so a lot of that history comes back with us. Um, I think it's passed down to our children and so on and so forth. I think what we're really seeing for some people is trauma. And then we see other people trying to emulate that trauma and see that and assume that's what it means to be a man, to be an adult, to be strong. And really people are just suffering and trying to adapting and trying to adapt to that. And I think that's really big thing to like notice, right? And I think that's why I like, it's easy to hyper masculize black men, specifically niggas, is because we've been through a lot of trauma. So we hold a lot of the traits like stoicism uh, a lot of times. Not me, I'm a loud mouth, I talk too much. But, you know, a lot of people hold stoicism because they've been through a lot. And so they don't want to speak on the whole thing. They don't want to burn people with their trauma. And it's what it is. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Uh, and I think that's where it makes a difference. Now, ooh, we have our own issues. We have our own issues. I'm about to get into those a little bit, but let's go.
However, I've known many cis men in the United States. We've all shared at least a few of these life lessons. And I know a lot of cis dudes have had it much worse than I did. Uh, my father's a kind, generous person who never roughed me up or psychologically abused me to uh, toughen me up like other dads have done. And you can see a lot of different lessons threaded through my experience. Some of them good, some of them not so good. You and I might even disagree on which of those were good lessons or not. And while I think that's an interesting question, I'm also extremely interested in the manliness lessons that I was never taught. For example, during my teens and early 20s, I was never taught that a man must always obtain enthusiastic consent for any sexual contact with someone else. I mean, it was sort of an unstated given that men who jumped out of the bushes and raped people were monsters and needed to be punished, but I never had a single man in my teens or 20s tell me or even acknowledge that having sex with a so, drunk girl- So, I gotta say, rape. that is one of the spots where we all correlate, as far as I can tell. Nobody told me or anybody I knew that it was rape to have sex with people that were loaded. Um, I think, I remember a lot of people would get loaded and have sex all the time. I do have some questions around that, around how people perceive that, because there is this, point of like assuming that women can't do no wrong around that because in my experience especially when it comes to drugs um and alcohol women sexually assault as much as men like especially in that specific way um and, and as far as other forms of sexual assault i think it's probably higher too um to be a hundred with you but i think one of those things is because our culture never taught us especially around that that's a problem with people will get drunk and have sex all the time with each other and like I guess it's not a problem unless it's a problem, you feel me? But at the same time, that's not how we should move about it, wait for till it becomes a problem for it to be a problem, you know? We should be figuring out how to change that culture and wrestle ahead of time. Uh, I think I think there's room for people to be able to get loaded and have sex. I think it's just one thing that has to be verified with consent prior to people getting loaded. You can't wait till people get loaded to consent. And if you have the type of relationship and y'all consented that and y'all clarified that and y'all boundaries, there ain't no problem. That's y'all's business, y'all handled it. But I think we should go into those situations like that. And uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of like back and forth, especially around drugs and alcohol uh, when it comes to sexual assault. Uh, and it's really fucked up. And I think men specifically should uh, be more cognizant of it because it feels like we definitely have the higher uh, right of making people feel violated with our actions. To be clear, I'm gender fluid, but like a lot of people will socialize to be male. So I'm gonna speak into that. Um, yeah, all right, let's get it. I never had a single man in my youth tell me that real men sought therapy and medication, that it wasn't weak to have depression or anxiety or other mental illnesses. In my youth, I never had men explicitly tell me that real men were allowed to quit something that was bad for their mental health. I never had men in my youth tell me that real men were allowed to be unconfident or unsure, that they were allowed to experiment sexually without shame, they were allowed to explore gender nonconformity without fear, that Real men could wear makeup if they wanted. That real men could be proud stay-at-home dads if it made sense. He's about to jump into gender, and y'all can watch the rest of the video over on their channel. Their channel is That Dang Dad. I will have a link in the description uh, so y'all can go check it out for yourself. Um, what I will say, what I'll say is uh, I definitely think there's some different differences, but one of the things I see, one of the things I see is in a big problem is not so much homophobia and transphobia to me in the black community. It isn't any more prevalent in the black community than the white community. Now I'm really tired of hearing people trying to say that bullshit. But what I will say is more prevalent is the expectation to be a normal cis person. And I do think that's different than homophobia and transphobia. I think that's his own thing and his own form of oppression. I think that's one way we really have to work on it, especially being able to see outside the box. Because a lot of people don't realize that Africa had gender fluid gods. Yeah, I said that, gender fluid god, transgender gods, or peoples that we came from. Worship gods that were trans, they worship gods that were gender fluid. And I think we need to really like think about where we pulled the transphobia and homophobia from, because it's really whitewashed bullshit. <clears throat> For masculinity, I feel that a lot of the things that white folks try to live up to 
um, around like their white masculinity is uh, that is around stoicism, that is about the use of force and violence. It's trying to already trying to live up to our peoples and people like our people, people who have went through trauma and survived. They're trying to mimic survivors, right? And the thing is, when people try to mimic something they're not, it gets very toxic. You know what I mean? I think that's a problem. However, it doesn't mute us from the way we have toxicity. Like it doesn't take that away from us because, and I don't by any ways think this is a one-sided situation. I know like that's a general narrative people want to push, but it isn't. People are complicated. We're all contradictions. But what I will say is we definitely have ways of putting ourselves to the center of the situation and not hearing women, right? That's the thing that like everybody who has been brought up as cis men generally do. I think, especially for niggas from the hood, because I'm not really talking about like bougie African Americans. There's this like self-destructive nature we carry too for us. And it's not like black on black violence, but we do carry a lot of self-hate that can manifest and harm like black women. They can put other women above black women, for example. Um, and I think that's some of the ways that we show patriarchy, right? I think in the hood, we're less likely to put white women over black women. However, I ain't gonna say people don't prioritize other women over black women. And that's one of the issues we have. I don't think we listen enough sometimes. I definitely don't think we're listening to enough either. But I do wanna say that we gotta work on our listening skills, including myself. I'm not immune from any of this. I think there's a lot of things that have similarities between black and white patriarchy, but there's a lot of differences. And one of the biggest things is that we're the antithesis, right? We're, we're the opposite, right? We are the ones that are hated. We are the anti-heroes to the white supremacist heroes, right? We don't gain all the privileges, but we do gain some of the behaviors. And we need to watch for that because we need to be effective at standing for our women, especially given the world we live in now. May I remind you, International Women's Day just passed, so show appreciating for the women in your life and hold them down. And let's, let's address our own masculinity and patriarchy to the best of our abilities. We're not gonna be perfect and we're not gonna agree with everything necessarily. We're not gonna agree with every single point uh, that every woman says. It's just not gonna happen. But at the same time, it's important to listen and then to do self-evaluations. At least that's how I feel. And uh, I'm not trying to be some hero. I could be a dickhead. I could be an asshole. I can be, I'm just another nigga in the day. I can do nigga shit. I'm just gonna be a hundred. I'm yes, a gender fluid nigga, but I'm still a nigga. And that's just is what it is. So I'm not perfect. And I have contradictions just like everybody else, but I try and we all should just try. If you like this video, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, hit the bell, make sure you personalize it so you can stay notified. Make sure to share this with anybody you think needs to hear it or just for the fuck of it. Leave a comment in the comment section. Let me know what you think the difference is between black and white masculinity or your experiences with masculinity and the patriarchy that has been associated with it. All right. Follow me at villainous underscore music at Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, SoundCloud, Twitch, and Patreon. So coming up Monday is a surprise. I ain't telling you what's happening, but make sure to tune in tomorrow where I'll be on a live stream fundraiser to raise funds to get this RV and keep me from being on the streets on a non-compete. Yeah, I'm on non-compete. Come fuck with me. I'm going to catch y'all later. Thanks for rocking with me. I am out of here. Deuces. Walking through the crease and the cracks of the streets. Struggling for some food and a bed to sleep. While trying to cause overthrow, I'm feeling weak. Ideology buff.